Um, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna go to the next session uh, for the living dictionaries uh, with Ana Luisa. Uh, and well, I just give you the uh, the microphone so you can continue. And if you have any question, please put it in the chat or in the Q and R section. And uh, at the end, we will go over it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm Anna Luisa Daño from Living Tongues Institute for Endangered Languages. Um, if you could give Greg Anderson also um, capabilities. Also, he's going to talk for a couple of minutes as well. Um, and um, so today our topic is living dictionaries. And I first want to say it's very exciting to hear all the innovations that uh, people are doing in this conference. I think there's a lot of opportunities for synergy since we've been working on different aspects of the same issues. Um, Greg, are you there? Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, there he is. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'll just start since there's no reason to delay. Um, yeah. So as Anna was saying, um, we're going to be presenting uh, on our uh, tool that we've been developing called Living Dictionaries. And um, the background of this is that technology can be disruptive because it can forever change the way people operate in their daily lives. So we pose the question to ourselves, what if technology could also disrupt bias and privilege? What if access to certain language technologies could help challenge language hierarchies and give endangered languages a fighting chance of survival? With over 3,000 languages in danger of being lost before 2100, we know there is a need to act quickly. So colonialism has had a deep impact on most countries of the world. The legal and social status of minority and underrepresented languages, as well as the resources that support them, are characterized by unequal distribution and injustice in almost every polity across the globe. With few exceptions, most nation states favor a single language over all others spoken in their territory. This institutionalized disenfranchisement has resulted in half of the world's languages undergoing an active shift towards dominant languages, and another 40% or so being threatened in a way that this process, this process will likely begin soon. The main reason that dominant language groups used to justify the continued disenfranchisement Okay. The, the main reason dominant language groups uh, have used to justify their continued disenfranchisement of the minority languages of their countries is that it's too costly to support all languages spoken in a nation. With regards to the financial impacts of multilingualism, the actual costs of maintaining language diversity have been shown to be not nearly as high as imagined, uh, referred to Grant 2003. Nation state ideology also typically believes a subtractive language policy is the best means for ensuring a national sense of self and to maintain territorial integrity. This is rooted in a naturalization of European romantic um, ideals that equate one people with one territorially bounded nation and one language. This mindset regarding linguistic diversity must evolve. Diverse languages need to be seen as resources that empower nations and not weak weaken them. Through this Living Dictionaries platform that Anna will be demoing. Um, the Living Tongues Institute has approached solutions to the massive global language extinction crisis by attempting to obviate institutionalized barriers that prevent equal status and equitable treatment of all forms of linguistic communication. Training local people to conduct language documentation and revitalization work and build dictionaries for their own communities is a core long-term aspect of our approach. Ideologies of what a proper linguistic variety to be used are not relevant to the living dictionaries. Decisions guiding what dialects are represented or not within a living dictionary are community driven. A digital dictionary may be created for any variety, whether it's oral or signed, recognized as a separate distinct language or just a dialect, patois, creole, pidgin, or any other lectal designation. Living dictionaries can accommodate as many dialects or variants as desired by the community members creating the tool. We feel that it is a moral imperative of the 21st century to decolonize and democratize linguistic resources. Online dictionaries should reflect their user communities and be tailored to suit the needs as well as curated by the citizen scientists that direct them. Community resources do have greater uptake and engagement by communities if they take a primary role in developing them. Living Dictionaries addresses this urgent need to provide comprehensive free online technological tools integrating audio images and multimedia that can assist endangered and other language communities, providing a simple way to create high quality multilingual documentation records. 
The platform is free because for almost all minority language communities, the costs of producing high quality linguistic materials are insurmountable. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> so what are living dictionaries? They are mobile friendly um, web tools where citizen linguists can build their own online dictionaries using any device. They're multimedia tools for language documentation and language revitalization or maintenance. They're accessible for free at livingdictionaries.app and I'll put that link in the chat in a little while. So our approach with it um, is building from the grassroots. So the projects are community driven where we really bring um, native speakers and community activists into the process of making these dictionaries. We offer training for citizen linguists um, and the platform is really good for remote collaboration. It's easy to use for people with limited digital literacy. It's accessible online with text entries being accessible offline. And we hold regular monthly training webinars where we ask for community user feedback and then we integrate their suggestions, um, questions into the design process of the app itself. And then we roll out new features regularly to try to improve it. So it's a work in progress. Um, we've come a long way and there's still a long way to go. This is a, a snapshot of the platform itself, which I'll also um, share when I show you how to create a dictionary. This um, interface you see is in Bahasa, Indonesia. So this is one of our um, main goals is to make the interface language of um, the platform itself available in as many regional languages as possible. And this is um, a picture from one of our recent Zoom webinars with our colleagues in Africa who are working on documenting their languages and languages in their regions too. So this is an example of um, the, the process that we go, we, we, we really mobilize and we try to engage all the people in our network um, to create their own resources, but also offer the training and support that they might need in that process. We currently have uh, 300 citizen linguists using the platform with more joining every week. And we really welcome you and uh, encourage you to sign up for an account and create your own dictionary. It only takes a few minutes and I'll, I'll show you that process soon. We currently have over 200 living dictionaries on the platform and the total entries that we have is 250,000 all combined together. And that, that number is growing as we also batch import uh, data from um, other digital dictionaries too. Um, so as you know, it's a, it's a work in pro progress, as I mentioned. Um, in the short term, we are uh, working on video integration in the next few weeks. Um, so that people can watch videos straight inside the platform and also record themselves inside the platform. We're adding more interface languages, uh, an international phonetic alphabet chart picker, um, export functionalities, links to ecological databases, and more regular training workshops. In the long term, we're also working on uh, speed optimization of the site, offline mode functionality, audio analysis, expanded storage, prompts integration, which I know some of the other presenters here have already solved some of these issues, which is great. Um, automated features such as an image bank, um, advanced training for linguists who wish to create monolingual dictionaries for their own languages. Um, so we're open to um, any questions about this at the end of the presentation. Oops, hang on. I'm going to go share my screen, my web screen for a second. Let me pull up my browser. Okay, so now I'm going to show um, how to, I'm going to show you the platform itself and how to create your own dictionary. Oh, et à la fin, je peux prendre des, des questions en français aussi ou en espagnol. If any of you uh, want to ask questions in uh, French or Spanish at the end, no problem. So uh, here's the main uh, website. So livingdictionaries.app is the URL. Um, these are the languages that exist on the platform already. Um, and these are the public dictionaries, uh, the ones that are available for public browsing. 
Um, so there's about 130 that are uh, public viewing and the rest, 70 or 80 or so, are still in production and they're in invisible mode. So they don't appear on the map yet because people are still working on it. So as you can see, we have um, a lot representing the indigenous languages of the Americas. Um, so this is this is very important to us that we are documenting these languages. In some cases, there's only a few speakers left. And in some cases, like Tutelo Saponi, Monacan, which is one we're actively working on right now, that one has no fluent speakers left, but it's being revived from archival materials and legacy recordings. So that's one way that we can get those resources into the pockets of people and descendants who want to access these language materials on their smartphones. We also have a few for Europe, but our main focus has been um, different parts of Africa and uh, especially South Asia and the Pacific Islands. Um, a lot of our big documentation projects are in India and a lot of the, the funding um, and the grants um, and the support behind this work is to document endangered Munda languages um, and other minority languages in India. Um, so some of the examples that I'll be showing today are from that region of the world since we spent so many years working there. Um, we also uh, offer trainings in different time zones to accommodate our colleagues in the Pacific Islands, um, Papua New Guinea, and so on. And while I'm here, actually, I'll just show you. Um, so uh, the language itself is in English on the interface, but you can change at any time. You can change it to Spanish, French, Kiswahili, Russian, Hebrew, uh, Portuguese, Bahasa Indonesia, or Malay. It's, these are some of the other languages that we're going to roll out in the next few months too, so that more people can really use this tool as much as possible. So now I'll run you through the quick process of creating a dictionary. So uh, first you create an account. Right now I'm logged in, but I've just used my Gmail to, to create an account. It takes two seconds. Then you click on the Create New Dictionary. And since we have a lot of uh, Breton speakers here, I'm just going to uh, show you the process for um, creating one for Breton. Um, so I'm going to put here um, uh, Brezonic, and I'm going to make this name populates the URL, as you see here. I'm going to make the dictionary available in English and French. Here we have a long list of glossing languages. Um, so this, we have about 300 glossing languages here for people who are adding translations to their dictionaries. They need to be able to have them and have the browsers recognize them properly by their BCP codes. Um, so we offer all of these languages um, to have your glosses, translations available in. Um, next, uh, you, you, if you want it to appear on the map, you can select the, the coordinates. So we've integrated a Mapbox plugin for this part. Um, so you can either navigate um, or you can search um, for a town or a village um, and it'll drop a pin for you. Um, or you can write the actual coordinates that you want. And so we're improving, we're working on improving this feature too, because a lot of languages are not just spoken in one a small village, you know, the way they are in many parts of the world. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, for example, you have, you know, a certain exact location with one language, but most languages are spread out over polygons and maps. So we're working on improving this mapping feature. Um, next, we can add in alternate names. So I'll add uh, Breton. Um, and then here, uh, people can look up the ISO um, 639-3 code. Um, so I'll put the modern Breton one and uh, Glotto code as well. So those could be all found on Wikipedia. And here is the button where you would click if you want this to be visible to the public or not. So um, that's uh, that's up to the, the community themselves and how they want their language to appear online. Do they want it to just be an unlisted link or do they want it to be visible to the public? So that's it. And then you create, um, uh, so if I wanted it to be um, visible to the public, I would then click that and create a dictionary. And um, since this, ex this language already exists on the platform actually, so um, it's telling me to choose a URL, a different URL because we have that URL already. 
So now I'll show some examples of um, how to add terms. So since I'm not a Breton speaker, I'm going to switch over to another um, living dictionary for Francais Québécois, which is one of my dialects that I grew up speaking. Um, so here you can see uh, some entries that we've already added. Um, so it's it's not very it's not very uh, developed yet, but we still have. Um, you know, we can we can import batch entry lists at some point. So this is just for demonstration purposes only. Um, so here we have the entry for the word uh, hiver. So you have the lexeme, the phonetic transcription, English gloss, Spanish gloss, part of speech, semantic domains, which are chosen from a long list of about 80 semantic domains that we have, and then some an example sentence using the word um, in French and English and Spanish. So if I want to add a photo, um, I just uh, select a photo from my computer and it uploads really fast. And then, I don't know if you can see me on the screen right now, but I'm going to add audio straight from my smartphone. So I'll show that process. Um, let's see if you can, you can see, yeah, you can see me now. So I'm actually on the same living dictionary on my phone. And I'm going to record the audio on my phone uh, in real time so that it appears and then I'll reshare the screen. So um, I just click on the microphone button and it gives access to my um, microphone. I select myself as a speaker. Sorry, it's a little hard to see. And then I just prepare to record on the microphone itself. Yvair. Okay, so now it worked. Um, you can see the waveform. So I'll go back and, um, oh, thank you. I see people are joining the platform. I'm getting notifications in real time. Thank you for joining. Um, and I'm gonna add uh, Tempête also while we're here. Since it's another entry that I have, I'm gonna add myself as a speaker and then record with my microphone. Okay, here we go. Tempête. There we go. Okay, so now that part is done, I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay, so now, right. So now if we go back, then we see this icon has turned into a, um, uh, a listening ear and now you can see it. So this is what I just recorded on my phone. Great, so uh, I don't know if that audio comes through Zoom, but, um, the audio is now on the platform and this one as well is is there too. Okay. So uh, the process, we made the process um, uh, seamless for working remotely because we do have a lot of people on the platform right now during the time of COVID especially who are working remotely in different parts of the world and they're working on the same resources and not everyone has the same digital capabilities. So in a lot of cases we have um, uh, younger, more tech-savvy uh, language activists or speakers or scholars who help work on the data and then we help train the speakers themselves who are then able to just go in and record the audio on their smartphones. Um, so it does require access to, to a smartphone or to a desktop um, with Wi-Fi for now, uh, but at least the, the text is available offline. Now I'll show you a couple of other examples from our living dictionaries that are more developed. So this is a language called Gita. This is a Munda language of India, as I mentioned earlier. So we have over 6,000 entries here. Um, I'm gonna show you, uh, we can refine, I'm gonna show you the filters. So uh, we can uh, refine by the different parts of speech. So if you wanted to create a lesson plan just around adjectives, or adverbs, you can get them all really quickly. So once again, this really is ease of access for, for people who wanna use this in revitalization. Also, if you wanna uh, filter by semantic domains, you could do universe in the natural world. You could just do um, a section on plants and soon we'll have an export bu button where people can retrieve this information and download it and access it and use it for other purposes. Um, so I'll show you, um, okay, so if you want to search for morphemes inside lexemes, that's very important 
for many languages of the world. So um, while it's displayed alphabetically, we can search for any string inside an entry. So this um, uh, morpheme here, pog, this is for butterfly in this language. Oh, sorry, bug. It actually means bug, insect in this language. So when I put in um, that morpheme, it, it brings up a whole, um, uh, a, a whole search results of just the ones that have this morpheme. And as you can see, there's a lot of butterflies. Um, so you can view this. This is list view right now that we're seeing this uh, search result. You can also switch to table. And uh, you can see them in a table and also edit them. Or you can see them as a gallery view, which is very nice for just exploring the images themselves. Um, so we're still improving these image features and everything, but it, it works great on uh, desktop and mobile so far. And we're excited to roll out the export when we can. I'll show you another example with the couple minutes that we have left. Um, here's another uh, di living dictionary from India. Uh, this is a language called Sora. And uh, this one is very multilingual. There's still a lot more work to be done, but it shows you how we can have accommodate different scripts for the orthographic representation, which is very important. So this is an entry for the word dogs, plural, in Sora. And as you can see, we have the head word written in, a, uh, uh, in the Romanized um, script, but also very importantly for this region of the world, we have it represented in Assamese script, Songteng Mardir, which is a local Sora script, um, phonetic, and then the glossing itself is in different regional languages. So Oriya, Assamese, English, Hindi, and down here we have the parts of speech, semantic domains, morphology, uh, interlinearization here uh, so that you can see the different morphemes and what they mean inside this word. And then the actual dialect of this language, which is West Bengal Sabar. And then there's more fields that you can enter also. Um, so this is an example of an entry that is quite accessible for a multilingual audience. And lastly, I know we have only a couple of minutes left. I could talk all day. Um, I'll show you what the batch import looks like, uh, which is also something we're refining over time. This is a language from Nigeria. It's called Olukumi. Um, and uh, our one of the Living Tongues fellows, Dr. Belenle Arakoyo, has been working on this language for many years in Nigeria. So she already had data. Um, let's see if I can pull it up. This is the her, her living dictionary data in a spreadsheet. So we worked on this together with her. She had it in a Word document originally. So uh, we worked with our interns and some volunteers and we got it all into um, this template, which we can share with anyone who wants to batch import. And then we simply imported it um, with our programmer, Jacob Boudouin. We, we um, imported it onto the site and now she's able to, she will start the process of, um, Bolanli will start the process of recording each entry. So that's what we do for batch imports because a lot of people already have huge corpuses. We also have a, um, uh, request form um, on the on our website on the FAQ page, which um, talks about how importing these existing data sets, what orthography they need, you know how it's working, and you know based on this we can um, uh, we can probably just go ahead and help them get set up digitally to make their their template for them. Or sometimes we have a Zoom meeting with the person and then work through any orthographic, special characters, issues, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we're able to Im import from Flex, um, Lexic Pro and some other formats. And we would love to work with um, Wiktionary and Wikidata Lexemes um, on other languages to uh, make more synergy between the different platforms. So um, I'm sure that I could say a lot more, but I want to turn it over to the audience for the last um, few minutes here. And uh, I see some questions in the chat. Um, yes, this is um, uh, our project is not open source yet, but we're actually going to be putting it open source in early July. So that's good news. Um, and the licensing of this project, it's a non-commercial web app. I don't have the exact code number on me, but yes, it's non-commercial. Um, Est-ce qu'il y a des questions? Do you have any other questions? Thank you so much. Uh, oh, I think we have one comment. 
Uh, how do you deal with language with no standard spelling or orthography? That's a really good question. We do encounter that issue um, often. So what we what we encourage people to do is to, if there's no standard yet, then to include um, as many spellings as they need of the of that entry. Um, and uh, as you know, orthographies are political choices in a lot of situations. So we don't want to be the ones who are deciding how to standardize the orthography unless the communities ask us specifically for linguistic help. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. See, there's another question. Uh, in the meantime, I have one personal question myself. Uh, yes. Is there a, is there a way uh, you're working some sort of API? Because when you have the dictionary, it's the possibility to create different apps for revitalization, mm -hmm. not only remains in the dictionary, you know, like, I don't know, some mm -hmm. translation, you can create machine translation things or something to translate or, or, or other tools. So uh, is that something that it's uh, available or is it some feature thing in API or some sort of stuff? We're thinking about that. Um, we're having conversations with different people who are who have different APIs available, like Wooloo, which just came out um, for machine learning and image recognition. The the issue with the way our license is set up is that we do not own the linguistic data that's on the platform. So we would really have to be community by community their decision with how they want their data to be available to the greater public. So. Um, because the data is in some cases very um uh very important that that it's kept in you know proprietary way so it just depends on the language we would have to create kind of like um a sort of buy-in section where people can click yes i agree for my data to be available on wiktionary or something else you know okay yeah okay. relevant for some north american languages that's a major concern Yes, a lot of them do not want their language data to be available to a larger audience. They just want them in their own communities. Yeah. And so we, yeah. we respect, we really respect that a lot. Yeah. Here's another question in the chat. I'm going to read it. It's in French. Est-ce que vous envisagez de réutiliser des données libres afin d'ouvrir une base d'information et d'éviter de, com de commencer un dictionnaire à zéro? Oui, on, on peut faire ça. Um, on, veut, on veut utiliser les, les, les bases de données libres. Um, S'il y a intérêt de collaborer avec nous, on est ouvert à des, des projets collaboratifs comme ça. Uh, en ce moment, uh, les, les dictionnaires sur, le, sur la plateforme sont créés par uh, uh, notre équipe ou bien par les activistes eux-mêmes qui veulent construire des dictionnaires. Donc, um, on est là pour euh, faciliter euh, ce procès. Mais euh, on, on grandit très rapidement avec une très petite équipe aussi, donc on essaie de <rire> euh, prendre les, les bons pas dans, dans chaque direction. Okay. Um, I have one, one question. Um, so thank you for the presentation first. Um, I was just wondering, um, you talked about many developments you wanted to implement in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there like one thing, um, like what's most important for you or for the speakers who use already living dictionaries? What's like the one main thing you would like to uh, implement? The most priority, uh, the highest priority is the export function right now because all the dictionary managers have asked for that because they want to be able to create their dictionary use it on their mobile phones, but a lot of them work in classroom settings too. So they want to be able to, you know, get the images and the audio and the text out um, for other purposes as well. So that's one of our top priorities. But we also have many other priorities, like we have um, right now about six other teams working on the translation of the interface. So we've mobilized a lot of people to make this happen. So we're about to roll out um, quite a few more. We just finished uh, Indonesian and Malay in the last few days. Uh, we have Arabic and Hausa and Filipino going on as well. And um, yeah, other than that, we're, we're, we really want to, right now, our, our goal is to get the news of this platform out in a grassroots way, which is what we're doing it, through this conference and others too. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think we have another question here. Um, what about lexical entries that are shared across languages? For instance, French, Fr Francais, Quebec. So that's uh, mm -hmm. 
That's a great question too. Right now, the way we've set it up, uh, so those would be multiple entries in different living dictionaries at the moment, since each dictionary um, has their, is, it's for a specific language or dialect. You could also have multiple dialects within one dictionary, no problem. So if you had that, you would, if you had the same entry, um, you could tag it with uh, one particular dialect, uh, or you can have as many entries as you want in one dictionary with different dialects tagged for each one. So they would still be separate entries at the, at the moment. Yeah, that's a very political issue, of course, is uh, some, some communities are, would want one collective with multiple dialects represented and other languages would want each dialect to have its own resource. So it's, it's really kind of an internal political situation that needs to be decided by the community members. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any other question? And um yeah that, the, the last question that i have is regarding to the iso language code is mandatory mm -hmm. you can or you kind of skip it because sometimes skip it. back to the 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 under the umbrella and one language could be several that actually only exist one iso code and that complicates the things uh with the communities that actually you know they don't find themselves within the that iso code mm -hmm. um so you can okay great yeah we should put a little note vice that it's versa too yeah you can change yeah. it later There's, in the settings yeah oh sorry some languages have more than one iso code um, yeah so yeah um the, the glotto code tends to be more comprehensive in that way um so that that's sort of a response to the problems with iso yeah and and it's optional step we actually didn't ask for it earlier but now we've integrated it because so many people want to have their exact ISO code, but it is problematic because there's um, a lot of languages, we have several languages on the platform that don't have, there's no ISO code at all for them. So it, it's an optional step, uh, but it does help with um, search engine optimization if um, if they do add it. Right. Yeah, yeah ISO is, is. has rife with problems. Yes, it's a, it's a uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a monopoly basically uh, of who gets to decide who gets an ISO code. So that situation is never great when you're dealing with citizen science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. exactly. And, and, and petitioning for one is easier said than done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I don't think that we have any more questions so far. Uh, I think we're gonna go to the pause, right, Damian? We're gonna start the pause. Mm -hmm.